Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the latest edition of the Woke Bros. Of course, I'm your co-host, Big Waz, a.k.a. Wazney Lambray. Nando Vila is not here today, but we have a very, very, very special guest um, in the building, man. I've very recently become a big fan of a lot of his work in the digital media space. Uh, professor Jared Ball um, is a professor of communications and Africana studies at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, and author of The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. Uh, Ball is also a host of the podcast, I Mix What I Like, co-founder of Black Power Media, which can be found at blackpowermedia.org, and his decades of journalism, media, writing, and political work can be found at imixwhatilike.org. Welcome to the show, Dr. Ball. It's a Ball. pleasure. No, thank you for having me. It's an honor. I appreciate you. Of course, man. Mm -hmm. um, just so folks understand... Um, I, I, I'm a big, big uh, fan of the folks at This Is Revolution. I count those guys as, as my buddies, um, Jason Miles, Pascal Robert. Uh, those, those are my people. And I remember you were up there one day, and I was like, man, this guy is, is really astute and just on it. Um, and so I started watching a lot of your, your stuff on Black Power Media. Um, and so, you know, pretty much anytime your stuff pops up on my YouTube, I'm 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 watching this stuff. Uh, by the way, incredible, incredible Malcolm X's assassination interview with uh, Baba Zach. That was so informative um, and entertaining. Quite frankly, man, uh, it's it's funny when when you know, in the media space with academics. A lot of people know what they're talking about, but are not compelling speakers. That brother, Baba Zach, he is a compelling speaker. Um, and, and so are you. And so thank you for coming on the show today. And what, we want, what I wanted to get with you first is about this PBS documentary on hip hop. You know, it's Black History Month. Uh, the, the major media outlets are going to do something for us allegedly. And I, and I love your critique because part of it is that uh, this stuff isn't really geared towards people like you and I, people who consider ourselves to be of the culture. But I, I thought your critiques were quite pointed in that um, it's limited what they present as the history of hip hop. Could you get into what, 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 what to your mind is the goal of this program and what makes it so limited? So again, I, I appreciate the invitation to, to, to your platform. Uh, the short of it is, I mean, you know, my approach to all of this is, is from a perspective that, that some, uh, um, you know, still struggle with, which is, which is more or less, uh, and not necessarily a perfect analogy, but basically from the, from the perspective that, that, uh, uh, black people in the United States to best understand their relationship to the United States, you have to understand it as a, a relationship of internal colonialism. So hmm. colonization is sort of the basis and the context through which I look at, at most of this. And then uh, through there, I think it's, it's a great way to synthesize all the existing debates and backs and forth between race and class and culture and which is primary and which is, you know, um, uh, I think the, a, a nice synthesis of all of that is the the in sort of an anti-colonial analysis, and then basically what that means for me, at least, is that with that as a as as a as a framework, and and uh, uh, the the basis being colonialism, it's an extractive relationship. So mm. everything is it's 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 about taking and turning it into something that will benefit both materially and immaterially those in power. So, yeah. for instance, when we're talking about the, this hip hop series, I mean, this is something that I've, I've I have a very unpopular, admittedly, uh, 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 critique of. But but I'm saying that okay, so this internally colonized population of black and brown folks create this cultural expression, this very pan African cultural expression that initially is suppressed and mm -hmm. avoided. Once it then becomes something, once once the colonial process took note of the fact that this wasn't going anywhere and that it could be manipulated, as is the case with all other cultural expressions in this context, 
that's what we started to see happen. Uh, so from the very beginning, you know, with 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 even Sylvia Robinson's, uh, who is initial, black for folks, a black woman, a black woman independent record label owner who had you know relationships with the major mm -hmm. record right. um distributors they were putting out you know r&b stuff uh mm -hmm. the, the the classic stuff that people think about when they think about black music in the 70s um and early 80s and she caught wind of this hip-hop thing that was happening and she essentially found three dudes <laughs> to steal <laughs> raps <laughs> from people and put names. it on wax and still raps and names put it on wax and sell and and that's the that's the first commercially successful hip hop record it was basically stolen um and then commodified and, and sold it to a great profit but you know I, it's interesting cuz on this show honestly Dr. Ball it's it's a it's a constant theme that black capitalists are no better than the white ones. Um, and I think this Sylvia Robinson uh, case is, is very mm -hmm. illustrative of that. It's like everybody operates within the same system because the rules apply across the board. <laughs> Whether you're black or white, the incentive structure remains the same. And so, yeah, like you said, from the very first record, um, it's being manipulated and and fucked up <laughs> that uh that's exactly what happened uh and 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 once it gets put on that sort of uh, uh machinery that process then we get all that we've gotten we get we get um uh, limited versions we get limited views we get we get a, a, and we get what what is my ultimate argument about this series and similarly because i know we want to talk about that as well the 1619 project piece mm -hmm. on hulu my critiques are basically the same for each one <clears throat> that that all of the problems of the world and that face black people are are presented but the 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 carefully constructed narrative is that the only responses to those problems have been the ones that have been selected and carefully manicured for, for mm. rotation. So, like I was telling my classes, even this this these last couple of weeks, it's like the the, the hip hop series is saying, okay, black people got oppressed, and then they came back with 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 a with a rap. Then they got oppressed. Yeah. Then they came back with a DJ. Then they got oppressed. Then they came back with some dancers. And it's like, OK, but you're skipping all this other stuff, not only in terms mm. of the content of those of that art, but all the other political activism that was going on. And then with the hip hop series, they've completely erased almost my entire generation's uh, 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 efforts with not only hip hop scholarship, but hip hop activism, mm. so whatever we might think of all of that. The series makes it seem like none of that occurred. Uh, and then other than one one or two quick glimpses of my comrade Rosa Clemente, the talking heads are professors and 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 media personalities <laughs> that don't have any, <laughs> at least in a couple of instances, they don't have any observable track record of, of hip hop academic work. They have not, the, my, to my knowledge, zero uh, uh, experience with the hip hop activist struggles and communities that 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 I was more familiar with. So. It's like, so what are we getting? We're getting what, what we're supposed to get, an American success story, as Dan Charnas' book says, and he's one of the talking heads on it, one of the white talking heads. So, so uh, I, I, I remember reading um, The Big Payback uh, when it came out by Dan Charnas and really enjoying it. Um, just the idea that there was somebody documenting the, the history, even if it's just the commercial history, um, the, you know, the commodification history of... Of the art form, I I enjoyed uh, sort of going through the timeline um, of going from you know Kaz to Modi to Kane to Rakim to Nas and Jay and all of that stuff, right? Because I'm a New York City guy, and you know it sort of feeds your ego to be like, oh, look at how great we are, aren't we incredible? Look at look at all these great guys. But I want to get to something. Before we get into the activism part and the more radical elements of hip hop that always gets left out of these mainstream histories, I th this the, the 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 main thing I wanted to talk to you about, which is what I struggle with, is 
Is there an in-between between being ignored and being commodified? When you say it started off as something that was a backwater, uh, you know, just this thing that these these poor inner city, lower class, because and people need to remember this too about upper middle class and middle class to upper middle class to rich black people at the time, they didn't fuck with hip hop. They thought it was gross, ghetto music. Radio stations wouldn't play it because who were they but upper class, middle class blacks? Everybody, all the black elite was like, this is trash. I don't fuck with this. Um, and so that's not even to speak of these rock obsessed white people in the music industry and what they thought of the art form. Black people, elites, thought it was trash. I, I really wonder what is a middle ground between acceptance from elites and completely marginalization, like no resources, no um, attention paid. What is that? What does that even look like? So I think, first of all, I think that's a great question. And uh, my short answer is that I don't think there is, there, mm. there is no wow. gap. There is no lane. And that's the trick bag we all find ourselves in. And that's sort of my point about starting with this analysis of, 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 of colonialism. That, that, that because un, until that relationship is changed, anything that gets plugged into it is going to either do what you're, is either going to marginalize or co-opt. Mm. We're not going to get. So I've, I've come up, you know, I named it after a former co-worker of mine who made this point back when we were delivering pizzas 30, 40 years ago. <clears throat> and I call it the Vernon philosophy of black media avoidance. And my point is that, that black people should not look for themselves in commercial media. It's oh, never, please really, say that again. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, and, and really, I'm saying this about any oppressed group, but no oppressed group should look to see themselves accurately reflected and they shouldn't want to given this context because of exactly the question you're raising. Now, I know it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. We all are, in, you know, I'm, I'm guilty as anybody else. I want to be entertained. I want to have fun, mm -hmm. but I'm constantly having to remind myself that there is no such thing as entertainment in this context. It is, it is all hostile. It's all hostility. It's all psychological mm -hmm. warfare. It's all uh, uh, struggles over public opinion and manipulation. So because the, the process of, of extraction is at play here. Uh, so whatever black people produce immaterially or materially has to benefit uh, a, a white settler colonial society. So either so even if even if the material benefit isn't so great, you know, black people don't produce that much money relative to other mm -hmm. areas of the economy. Um, the immaterial need of of whiteness and eliteness uh, requires a re constant reproduction of anti-black, anti-poor, anti-woman, anti every every other everybody. So, so that's so that's my quick answer. So, uh, and that's why I think we're in we're in this this difficult situation that and 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 even with what you just described, what I think you know part of what has become a a, a, a sort of a humbling but but self critique of my generation is that in our desire to defend hip hop's emergence against that black bourgeoisie to a certain extent, we miss the fact that some in that black bourgeoisie were actually making some good points here and mm -hmm. there, particularly around the intervention of corporate America uh, and what was being used politically with the anti-black messages that were coming out of, of not, not just hip hop itself, but, but it's, it's popular a, a, a negative description. So in other words, when it, which has become my point is that when C. Dolores Tucker is saying corporations are going to make, uh, not only produce the worst of us, but then take advantage of that worst production to, to politically <clears throat> reposition us for incarceration and exploitation, she, myself included, was, was condemned. Like everybody condemned her as she's a traitor, she's just old, she's just mm -hmm. this, that, and the third. And this becomes part of the narrative that Charnis and others regurgitate. But what I actually did in my in, in some limited limited work of my own is I went back and looked at what did Charnis, what did Jeff Chang, what did early hip hop journalism actually say about C. Dolores Tucker? And what I found and what I've demonstrated in, in a little essay and presentation of mine is that they misquote her, they misrepresent her, and, mm. and create a context in which we ha can have today narratives like this series that say 
hip hop started from the bottom and now we're here. It got us, it changed the world. It blackened the world. It browned the, it, the tanning of America, they called it. it. It provided the gateway for us to produce more black millionaires and billionaires and the presidency of a Barack Obama. So the very community, <laughs> the very generation that was initially saying the black bourgeoisie can't tell us what to do, can't do this, that, and the third. We have now are claiming credit for having expanded. And then that same black bourgeoisie links up with, of course, the dominant white elite to reproduce a version of our histories that tells us you don't need to struggle. You don't need to have radical mm. ideas. You just need to do some art that we like. You just need to... You just need to, and as we'll say with my argument with the 1619 Project, you just need to conclude politically something that we can easily incorporate into our mainstream political apparatus that's going to produce zero in terms of actual change. And, and yeah. to simply do that, and I'll stop here, in each case, all you have to do is you, you, you define Black radicalism by the definitions of the Black bourgeoisie. So the PBS documentary literally starts showing us Killer Mike, as the left killer brain. mike is a black radical he's depicted <laughs> as as from the very first episode of that series as carrying on the tradition okay <laughs> and then you erase uh um and i and 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 i should have the timing was a little off with this i didn't quite get to finish the last episode mm. but what you what you what what is so i'm i'm open to be criticized here but what i'm i'm predicting is is that and and i'm and i'm quickly looking at it in the background here, they're erasing, they've already erased X-Clan, Poor Righteous Teachers, they, mm. Brother D. They've already erased so much of the early radical hip hop that was coming up and the er radical messages of removing chains and putting on black medallions and all those kinds of cultural shifts that, the, that those in power, black, white, or other, didn't want to see happen uh, and that corporations have helped erase by now. And then the 1619 Project, they do the same thing by erasing, so in, you know, in terms of the response to enslavement, the response to the prison system, they erase all of the black radical, black power era. They erase all of the more militant organizing and, and definitions of struggle, et cetera, and so forth, so that they can conclude with the very, I think, empty claim or call for reparations based oh, on, God. Uh, you know, Sandy Darity's analysis. So, so my point is, <laughs> is... I mean, my, really, my point is, is that we is, it, we're, we're in a very difficult moment uh, where where uh, making producing an analysis in the face of all of this this propaganda is very difficult. So, I want to you know self snitch right and, and talk about myself growing up as a kid in both Brooklyn and Queens, New York. Um, first, my first rap hero is definitely Biggie Smalls. I'm like seven or eight when Juicy comes out. Wow. Um, Biggie dies. You know, I become a Jay-Z fan. And in fact, it, it's funny looking back at it, Dr. Ball, in the sense that the big arguments in my neighborhoods was between Jay-Z and Nas and the idea that Jay-Z was the embodiment of all these things you just said, which is true, and that Nas was the other thing, even though now he's a venture capitalist and blah, blah, which is hilarious to see now. But at the time, it was this sort of, it, it was an East versus West. It was capitalism, communism. It was whatever you want to call it. Culturally, especially in New York, that was the, the argument that we had, right? But I just responded more to Jay-Z, just this idea of just like, I'm going to win. I'm going to be better. I'm going to succeed. I'm going to do it on my intellect. I'm going to be the best, whatever. Um, the sort of poor righteous teacher, Nas, take it back to Africa. It always felt empty to me. Even as a kid, it felt empty and pie in the sky. As an adult, I realized I was right. Um, but that was sort of the my lineage and my rap fandom. And everything else that I liked flew, sort of flowed out of my interest and obsession with Jay-Z's music and his his movement, right? And then so you fast forward, you get a little older, you get a little wiser, and you and I've become, I'm 36 now, I've just become very turned off by the excesses of the messaging, right? Where I'm on my social media and I'm supposed to feel happy as a black person that Rihanna's makeup brand is worth a billion dollars. 
or that Jay-Z can sell a liquor company or his share in it for 700 million. Um, I find that, like, I'm turned off by that. My politics don't align with that. I know people who have worked at Rock Nation. They're underpaid as fuck. Um, it's, it's horrible working conditions. All of that stuff, right? Like, I, I, like I've, I've made a basically a 180 on this Jay-Z thing. I still enjoy the music, but it's a conflict internally. This is what I'll ask you, though, however. This is a little bit of pushback. I really do wonder how successful or popular or how much reach a message that wasn't about glamour could actually have. When we talk about a music that's founded and just making shit that people could jam to, people could hang out at the park to, people can, you know, go to school dances to. I wonder how effective uh, a radical or even just like, hey man, you know, uh, your mom needs a union job or something. Like, I wonder how effective that sort of messaging could ever be in a music, right? And so in effective meaning a bunch of people are gonna like it, listen to it and wanna move their lives to it. I, I wonder that. Oh, I, I so, so so I hear what you're saying, but so I tend to look at it. Well, first of all, I think we don't have to speculate. I mean, hip hop history even so, somewhat answers that question. I mean, uh, look at the popularity at one point of Boogie Down Productions and and KRS and his in his career uh, had had a had a, a, a you know varying degrees of black radical and progressive messaging. Public Enemy was obviously incredibly famous globally. Even Dead Prez uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the early two thousands uh, was was relatively very popular in this country and around the world, even despite a system that had already blocked them out from being heard and even having mass reach to their audience. So there's the, the, the real issue for me is not, it's not the, it's not that communities won't respond to radical messaging. I think that, that that's again, historically proven to be false. I mean, what, what keeps Tupac enduring for many is a legend, even beyond his, his contradictions are those progressive and radical messages in his music and his performance. It's the same thing with people like, you know, even I, non, I, wonder, non I wonder about that. And, and I'm okay. not just saying All that right. as a, as mm -hmm. a hating ass New York dude. That's cool. I, hear you. I, I, hear you. I, I really wonder how much of the messaging that resonates is, you know, they got money for war, but can't feed the poor versus hit them up. I really do. I, I truly wonder which one is more resonant. I think, well, again, I think, I don't think there's much substance to it. I was thinking more symbolically. I think people mm. think of, when they think of Pac, they think of something radical. They're not thinking gotcha. of, they're not, I, so they're not digging into the content and, and, and deeply analyzing his lyrics or his contradictions. That's sort of my point. Gotcha. Um, by the way, up until the Black Album, Jay-Z was my biggest contradiction. He, I, I mean, <laughs> even as a, as a consciously radical person or wanting to be revolutionary person, I, I was a huge Jay-Z fan. And even this morning, I was listening to him. Uh, um, and even to your point, I, you know, I was listening to the Marcy track when he said, I, you know, where I'm, I'm from where drug czars evolve with thugs are at odds and at each other's throats, throats for the love for of our cause. And, yeah. they, and, they bit, and, the, and the debate is who's the best MC, Biggie, Jay-Z, Jay and Nas. And Nas. Drug yeah. czars evolve. And the, anyway, so, so, so yeah. Um, but, but uh, so I hear you, uh, but what I'm my, really, my point is, is that I think communities are always open to radical messaging. And that's why mm -hmm. so much is done by the apparatus that exists to make sure those messages don't continue. So that's why I'm saying there was, there, you know, uh, uh, and historians like Dave E.D. talk about this. This is why I'm disappointed that he's not in this PBS mm -hmm. series, but yet I understand he can't be because you have to position other people to do this work. But what Davey D and others have pointed out historically, I mean, there were moments in the 80s and even into the early 90s where the, the hip hop community on its own, and really what we're talking about is the black community, the black and brown communities coming together to say, look, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do all of this bling in and violence and stuff. We wanna talk, that's why I'm saying there were, uh, and rest in peace to Dave who just passed, it was, the, it, I'm thinking of at least one De La Soul video in particular, uh, where, where they you, you see them taking off the gold and putting on black medallions. They had the meeting at Latin quarters with all the, the big time figures to talk specifically about moving in a certain direction. And part of the response to that 
is the, the, the corporate reorganization, the colonial reorganization to produce and promote other forms of the art. So it's not that communities don't want radical art or won't respond well to it. It's just that they don't get it. They don't get it in the overabundance and steady diet that we get of everything else. So Biggie, uh, um, for some of us, as great as he was, was seen as part of that that of political course. shift, the, the <laughs> imposition of 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 the, the haves and the have and nots. Uh, it's funny because because yeah. Questlove talks about it a lot. Um, because there was this perception, you know. Remember they dropped that video. It was like a spoof. It was like this champagne and, yeah. and the video chicks and blah blah blah. Do what and, they do. do what yeah, they exactly. Do what they do great, what they, great yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and and Questlove, who by the way, super rich now, Jimmy Fallon. The, the, well, the, see, the, that's my point. If, you, if you've <laughs> seen the movie Bamboozled. <laughs> they are literally playing their 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 lampooning their their real life is mimicking that yes. movie where yes. they played the porch monkeys I think was the name of their band on that show. Doctor Bo, so, so much are. so much so I got an email yesterday about Roots Picnic, their music festival that they put on in Philadelphia every year. Um, mm. Puff Daddy is headlining it. Come on, man. <laughs> That's crazy. And this is crazy because we all know, like, like in, in real hip hop heads, whatever, will remember that the roots. Come on, yes. man. Yes, yes. No, but and, that's and what we, I'm saying. We know, like, we know the skill, and we remember Malik B. Rest in peace. Like we remember what these folks. Yeah. So it, it, it's painful. Like, of course, I'm happy that you, we. It's that 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 trick. I get it. We want to see black people succeed. We want to see people. We who want to see black people do well. well. But but what is the 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 net collective impact is not good to see them go from the margins to being on Jimmy Fallon. And I have so, always I hate seeing that. I won't watch it. I can't, <laughs> I, I watch Jimmy Fallon anyway. But I refuse to watch because I'm not watching. You know legends. Black Thought is a legend MC. <laughs> what he's, paying, he, he's paying his bills, man. I get it. I, I mean, he's I'm saying. His, but, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing, too, though, that I don't think, and it, and it relates to hip hop. It relates to my industry, media, because, you know, my main job is in sports media. Um, but just media as a as a whole, um, I, I was in Salt Lake City for NBA All Star Weekend, and um, and you know it's a bunch of it's just basically a brand summit at this point. Like there's the game and the activities, but essentially it's brands who want to attach themselves to M the NBA, which produces bona fide American celebrities, 100. percent There's no two ways about that. And actual celebrities, music people, artists are attracted to this event every single year. And brands want to attach themselves to that. Anyway, I'm at some brand's party. And, you know, some two, two women overheard me having a conversation with my homie. And I was explaining to him, like, look, man, like, no black person is going to solve the ills of the black masses, especially here in America, from their job at Goldman Sachs. Just to just give an example, right? Just because Goldman to me is the, it, it's always my go-to because it's the embodiment of the problems with America. <laughs> like, it is the corporate embodiment of all that is fucked up about this place. Like what do these people produce but misery and greed? Anyway. Two women of color come up to me and they're like, oh, we overheard you talking about Goldman. Do you work there? I was like, no. In fact, the opposite. I was explaining that like, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs can hire like four black people to be on their board and pretend that they're doing shit for, you know, desolate black people in Mississippi. It's absurd. And they were like, well, you know, to be honest, you know, how are black people supposed to even get in the room without people like us and blah, blah, blah. I was like, yo, you can get some black people who you know, some nicer jobs, who you know in your circle. They're not going to be no black plumbers or electricians or whatever. It's going to be some professional blacks that you hook up with a gig at Goldman and they might do the same three to four people at a time, 
there's 40 million Negroes in this damn country. You like, you just can't do it. Right. But when you get into those jobs and those spaces, and I don't think it's any different when you're Questlove um, and Black Thought or when you're whoever and you get into these spaces, you really start to believe that <laughs> it, it is uh, uh, an improvement for most black people that your personal life has been upgraded and that you're going to do like your contributions to the blacks is that you're going to get like five people, some nice jobs at Goldman and JB Morgan Chase. And that'll be that, you know, like I like it. My, what I'm, my point is that when you get there, you really believe this shit. <laughs> like, people no, really it's, believe it's, it. It's again, why so much of my work is, is, is an attention has been paid to messaging propaganda. It's, mm -hmm. it's very powerful. And we hear it from from day one uh, in our whole lives, everywhere we go. Even again, in the background, I'm looking at this thing in, 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 in on mute and double speed. So I'm not performing an analysis on it. But I'm seeing this this last episode of that series is saying hip hop brought us Obama and they're showing us Puffy and Jay-Z oh on stage with Obama. And there were some of us. And this is what and I'm that's saying. Supposed to be I, seen as a good thing. And at the time, I was part of a small group of people saying this is not working. This is not going to be good. And to the point you're making, part of our analysis was look at who Obama has already, even before his election, said is going to be on or before his inauguration is saying Whoa. is going to be on his. The team. Goldman look Sachs at, president. <laughs> OK, <laughs> how can that be a good thing for anybody? It, it, it's And, you know, I often make the point that. These corporate front-facing Negroes are doubly horrible because not only do they not do dick all for black people, they turn the masses of poor whites into even more reactionaries. They make whites even more racist. They make them even yeah. more mad. Because it's funny. like it's performing, it's performing the task. It's doing both jobs at once. Um, it's convincing poor whites that the masses of blacks are somehow passing them, which is a joke. Um, and it's also convincing black people that the masses of blacks are going so far. We're going to, it's, it's just cruel how that shit works on, on both ends. And like, you know, people in my life, cause again, and, and I'm not going to pretend that like I go to dinner parties where I meet black janitors. I don't, you know, like, it's not as if the people in my life or in my social circle who I'm not like actually related to. Um, I get to interact with the only people I'm interacting with who are black are these black professionals here in LA who work in sports, work in music, work in some form of entertainment adjacent industry. And trust me, these are the conversations they're having, Dr. Ball. But I want to move on because we don't have a lot of time. I want to move on to Hulu's 1619 project. And I remember reading the 1619 stuff. Um in the beginning, and uh, you know, I was like, "Oh, this is cool!" Like the New York Times is like doing a, a bit of a deep dive on slavery, and then you know, I saw that there was some critiques, and you know, just as a as a Haitian American, right? Like my family is from my both of my parents are Haitian immigrants, and once you have like even a rudimentary um, understanding of of Haitian history you understand that there's nothing really exceptional for real about the way slavery was carried out here in America, right? Like the mm -hmm. actual institution, like you said, it was an ex extractive enterprise. Um, there's coffee, there's tobacco on this damn island. Let's get some people to work it. We'll sell it, you know? Um, they're not even work it, sorry, let's get some slaves, people we don't pay. Right, so you can't even say they're working it. They're and, and, and how did that black bourgeoisie leadership work out down there? Boy, boy, mm -hmm. listen, that but that's another <laughs> that's another conversation. I'm just saying it's a lesson to be learned. That's what no, I mean. it's that's it's what a it's a it's a huge lesson. But I think to me, my my main critique of 1619 was this this exceptionalizing of American slavery, right? Like I, to me from the very beginning, is this idea that there was nothing like American slavery. 
Mm. And I'm just like, that's just a crazy conceit to begin with. Um, and, and I just think it's wrong. I think it's not true. And in fact, you know, if you if you do some of the research, like the life expectancy of a slave in um, San Domingue was like three years or something like that, that they brought over. Like it was even more cruel than what they did in America, because at least in America, they had the good sense of being like, oh, let's get some some people that they do rice in that part of Africa. We gonna have them do rice on the Carolina coast. Oh, they do this. Like there was some like sense of like strategicness to what they were doing. The French were just like, let's get everybody from everywhere. Half of these motherfuckers are warlords and these dummies were just like, oh, they're all Negroes. There's no difference. They're all just these, these Africans. And, and that was part of their demise. But I thought like just from the beginning, the, the whole conceit of 1619 was just like super navel gazy American shit. Um, and then I read, and then I, you know, not read, but I watch your critique, which isn't even of the TV show, which has, I think is an even deeper layer um, of just this narrative um, of just like, I, I don't know, like how they describe the black struggle. I just feel like it's more step stepping, uh, step skipping, excuse me. Um, if you can, could you just summarize what your critique of the project was at on Hulu? I don't know what your critique was of the, yeah, yeah. the, the paper. Well, I didn't read. I didn't read. Uh, I have the book, uh, which has all the essays in it, but I haven't read it closely enough it, that I it, that I would feel comfortable you know, being critical of it. So I did limit my criticism to what was seen to the, on Hulu. To the TV show, right? And um, uh, so, at least two quick points. One they only do mention the Haitian revolution um, sort of in passing to, to acknowledge that it had some influence on those here <clears throat> wanting to uh, um, up, uh, further their efforts to, to rebel and whatnot. But there wasn't, uh, um, but the goal is clearly, and this is the point I was trying to make, the goal is clearly to cut black America off from the rest of the diaspora. Mm. So that these because that's the only way you can make that final pitch, which is the ultimate goal of the series uh, to get reparations. So they're not attempting to join a sort of international reparations movement or struggle that does exist, by the way. Mm. Uh, they're just simply trying to narrow it so that black Americans can make an appeal to the. So the whole thing, that's why the, the cover is literally a black kid wrapping himself in an American flag. Um, <laughs> the whole point. <laughs> the whole point of the series is to 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 remind the country that, yeah, you've abused us, but we did build this place. So when we come to you by the end of the series for our reparations call, you'll you'll be you know primed for it. And 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 the flip side for me is that Disney and Hulu and all the other executives are fine with that because they know that that's not a threat to them politically. There's never going to yeah. be my humble estimation. There's never going to be. Uh, 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 a bill passage pathway to massive redistribution, and Sandy Darity, who's who's interviewed, he's he's saying you know that each of us should get three hundred fifty thousand dollars or fourteen trillion dollars. So the United States is not going to do that, not without some revolutionary movement that that might as well go for the whole bag. So so that's my thing. Now the flip side is, so I get it. So I just want to sort of. Uh, um, I don't know if this is a full pushback against what you said, but but I want to carefully frame it because mm -hmm. you are right that there is an attempt to essentialize the United States and the black experience here. And there is an attempt to deny, as I was saying, black people's connection here to the rest of the diaspora. But I don't want that to be confused with these conservative efforts to make it seem like particularly uh, uh, that, 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 that black people here or that particularly radical black people here are wanting to be disconnected and don't no. realize that. So no, for instance, no, 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 just, no, no, Just quick. So like, I'm aware that like only 5% of the enslaved ended up here in the United States. Right. So like most of us got dragged, our ancestors are all over the Caribbean and Central. And, and Brazil. South yeah, yeah, yeah. Brazil, yeah. That's what I'm saying. So, so uh, uh, but, but Hulu, and the relatively conservative uh, black uh, uh, creators are involved with this project are clearly saying 
this is an American issue because we here in America, we're not, we can't get, they're saying, I can't get reparations from Haiti. I can't get reparations from Brazil. I can't get reparations, but I might be able to get one from over here. So, and then very lastly, the one thing that I, uh, one little bit of evidence I want to share here that, that leads me to this conclusion is that we know that Nicole Hannah Jones has said that part of her analysis for the original 1619 project was the work of Gerald Horn and his his Counter Revolution of 1776 book. But he doesn't show up in name or on screen in this series. And uh, and I, and he doesn't have a contribution to the to the officially published book. And in my my suspicion with that is that this is done because his analysis is too pan African. His analysis mm-hmm. is too based on America as a settler colonial state that that somewhat akin to what I'm saying here uh, uh, cannot adjust itself in the way that these, these folks want it to be adjusted. And then his argument, uh, uh, broadly speaking, uh, about what this country wanted in terms of defending the institution of slavery and black people here being connected to the diaspora is not something that's going to help a project get itself um uh <laughs> you know, conclusion of reparations getting funding so so it's it's a very slick it's just very slick and it's well done it looks good all the people on there are pretty they drop enough little things in there to maybe make you think it's saying something you know threatening and uh and then it just walks us safely away you know to 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 very safe and absorbable conclusions just just um briefly because, you know, my audience might not be as learned as yours on a lot of these topics, right? Um, and so I, I just want to briefly explain to people why reparations are bad. <laughs> not that it's like the the movement for reparations, why it's bad. I, I Like, to my mind, um, one, I, I think politically it's suicidal. That's just one. I just don't understand how you build a mass popular movement towards reparations for 9% of the population. How do you get a mass of people on board to make that happen? I don't see a path for that. That that's, that's to me, that's a fatal flaw, but two, even beyond that, even if let's just say we got this rock up the hill, Dr. Ball, and we got reparations for the masses of Black American specifically. Um, and I, in full disclosure, like I said, I'm a Haitian American. My people didn't toil here. I won't get a dime of reparations. So people might say, oh, you have this position because <laughs> you won't get any. <laughs> cool. That's cool. That might be a critique. Cool. Um, I To me, if that ever happened, if they literally ever wrote checks to black people, that's the end. Don't ever ask for shit again. Like, don't don't ever protest. Don't ever talk about how hard your life is. Don't ever talk about struggle. You you got your check. Now shut the entire fuck up forever. That's that's my opinion of reparations and the movement, you know, ADOS and all this other crazy shit. What what is your sort of critique of this, you know, this analysis that what black people need in America more than anything else is reparations? So I mean, it's it's. I largely agree with what you were saying. I, you know, tactically, it's 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 flawed as an approach. Again, we can't even get to the point where they would pass a bill just to conduct a study, much less <laughs> actually pay out the money. Uh, um, you know, but but for me, it comes back to what have all of the 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 luminaries that we all point to ever advocated. And reparations has really never been part of a, of a platform of any major movement or, or leaders or whatever. And in part, that's because it doesn't address some of the core problems. Like it doesn't, exactly. it doesn't change the relationship we have to the society. It doesn't change the way wealth is created. It doesn't change uh, uh, our ownership of the, the most productive elements of the economy. It doesn't change our, it doesn't do anything other than postpone the inevitable, which is a march right back to where we are. And then to your point, it doesn't change anything in terms of political power. So you end up with a situation where 
uh, uh, black people may have some more money in their pocket and may have some some more options here or there. But eventually all of that money is going to go away. It doesn't stop anybody from getting dragged by the police or getting incarcerated or getting locked up. It doesn't mean that you're going to have an you're, you're going to in perpetuity make well. Well, Dr. Society. Ball, they're going to get they're going to get these reparations and just start buying black. <laughs> they're going to buy black. But again, and, and this is sort of my point. Like we, we've already seen it. And this is where some of my own work comes in. Like like one of the major that's sort of why I said what I said about where we are in the economy. If, if OK, you, if, if, if you and I both woke up tomorrow, uh, granted, you might not get a check. I might only get half a check, you know, uh, you know so like, like, <laughs> yes, you, know, you so, are. So we, you are right, half Jewish. <laughs> right. My mother, my mother's white and a Jew. So I mean, I might not even get. So who knows what? So so I wake up with my half a check. You don't get a check. Um, what do I do tomorrow? Like tomorrow, like I'm going to spend that money where? If I want to buy black, I could only buy in certain areas of the economy that don't satisfy all of my even needs. Never mind my wants. I mean, you mm -hmm. there, there aren't enough. Are and then if you buy find black gas, you're gonna buy. Well, black I don't know where you would, but but, <laughs> but even if you found like the the black toilet paper supplier, currently, so that you know where are they? So so then they're gonna. I mean, this is like like I've, I've I try to walk like think about this. You find that there are there's at least one that I know of a black toilet paper supplier. But if mm -hmm. we all have the money to actually get to the point where we would all buying all of our toilet paper from this one supplier, they would obviously have to scale up. They couldn't satisfy the demand right now. So then where are they going to go? First of all, who are they going to hire if everybody's sitting on $300,000? Who's going to go work mm -hmm. for them? So, so that you're going to go hire what? You're going to go hire whites and Latinos? So then, so that your business is then what? Black owned only and no black workers? Because part of the old black business thing is that you're going to be employing black people. So who's going to yeah. work there? And then, and then what? Who's going to invest the millions that would have to be invested to scale up, to get the machinery, to mass produce, to get the cheaper raw materials, to get the trucks, to get the planes. Who's going to do all that delivery to all these <laughs> millions of black people with all this money that want to buy your toilet paper? So that's just toilet paper. You said right. something very important. Who's going to be supplying the gas and the electricity? I'm in Maryland. We only have one <laughs> electricity supplier. What's going to change that relationship? Uh, by we, the way, know, those those companies exist at the behest of the state, by the way. Like people don't exactly. understand this. <laughs> like people don't understand this. Like these utility companies, like they the state long ago decided, like, yo, you guys have a monopoly. We're gonna let you rock. You can't price gouge our people, right? But again, and we know how iffy all of that gets, but again, those companies exist at the behest of the state. Which will not be black owned. <laughs> this is why my thing is, it, you know, and this is why I like to, you know, I don't have all the solutions. I don't have all the answers, but I keep no, thinking if we're, sure. if we're organizing to get big enough and threatening enough to to impose reparations on this society. Why then not go for something bigger? Why would we only yes. want one three hundred and fifty thousand dollar payout? Why not have why not guarantee that everybody in the country gets $350,000 every year. Like this is the kind of wealth that is produced in this society right now, before we even get to the revolutionary step of changing how wealth is created. We're mm -hmm. already producing 20 plus trillion dollars every year as a society. So maybe not everybody could make 350,000 a year for, 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 for all for that, but, but the redistribution would be crazy. And, and, yeah. and that would be more like why would and that you know, not be the goal rather than um you know and I'm, again and it's not a, it's not a denial that black people in this country have a particular specific need that needs that is not addressed it is simply to say tactically why not just say we should all chill uh uh um uh, or live more comfortably and have some a situation that's more likely you know to result from that then but that's my point and this is really the really where where and even where I would want to just put a bookend on this is that is that the real goal here is not to have us uh either get or not reparations the goal is to have us focused on reparations as an issue so as that we never are advancing else. there we go that's it and man uh, i i just love your analysis of cultural production in this country and you know when we use terms like cultural production it's just shit that we consume right like tv shows movies music um if you could put a warning label on this stuff you know <laughs>
for 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 the masses of, of of black people, brown people, oppressed people all over this country, um, what would you be saying to them about the cultural production of of America? <laughs> Watch out, dangerous! This is the poison. <laughs> like, don't you know? Like, you know, I'm 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 simplifying older concepts. Like, none of this is none of these ideas really originate with me. I'm 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 simply trying to apply them to this specific situation. And and the yeah. point is oh is the same is that that why do you like what you like and how do you know what you know? I always ask this in my classes. It was asked of me as a student. You know, what is, because it's not to say you should change what you like or what you know, but but really investigate how you've yeah. reached your conclusion from the hard stuff like religion to the more easy stuff like your favorite TV show. Because it's like, what's really going on here that, you know, because whenever something, you know, and my thing is whenever a TV show or a song comes out that I like, I, I get suspicious. And I'm like, <laughs> how did you... Like Disney put it, we talk about Hulu, like, like as much as I hate 1619 Project, they put together this Abbott Elementary sh School show, and I love that show. And yeah. I'm like, well, how did you, I was like, you slick motherfucker, boy, you, you found a way, you put Cheryl Lee Ralph in there, got my, my old crush on there, you got, you got this slick little black documentary style TV shit, like you got all these little jokes in there, that I, like you, but what are they really ultimately conveying with that? And what do they get? as a reward for even getting someone like me to like it. And that's really where I start to, you know, so that's really all I would want to put somehow on a, on a label, like warning, this is poisonous, you know, like <laughs> it's like French fries, you know, you, you, you're really going to like it, but it's not good for you. Uh, you know, it's, 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 and, and be careful. And then on the, you know, maybe on the back say, you know, go, you know, uh, uh, check out Woke Bros and I mix what I like. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> Absolutely. Because you, know, like, you got to get, you you have to have, I don't, I don't know. That, that's that's really what I, I, it's the same thing. It's it's everything with me is, is just a warning. We just have to be very careful how we engage and be aware that this is part of a process that is exploiting us. Um, and there is no such thing as entertainment. And 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 it's not me speculating. It's from, from the people who put together so much of our media apparatus it's understood that 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 messaging and propaganda and psychological warfare is more easily disseminated if you think what is you're you're dealing with is just entertainment mm. um but we have to ask why are military people who are funded and owned by military contractors and oil companies and intelligence agencies. Why are they the ones producing all of our TV shows? I mean, how is it? I mean, could you could the, you could the, you could you expound yeah. upon that when you say people who are funded by you know military contractors? Would you mind giving an example of like, all right, this company produces this mainly, but owns a stake in X, Y, and Z as well? So, so, well, first I would want to say that, that my favorite, is, there's a, a book I, I talk about all the time that came out just a couple of years ago called National Security Cinema. And it details the history of intelligence agencies uh, uh, producing so much of the military and propaganda that we watch, the thousands mm -hmm. of TV shows with the mm -hmm. police. They're literally written by and, and scripted by s former CIA agents and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, but if we just look, I mean, um, I, I don't have it in front of me. It's, uh, so some of the details I won't have off the top of my head. But but if but all of the major, uh, whether it's Disney and who owns Hulu exclusively at this point, whether it's whether it's um, all of the major networks we would have seen on on cable, NBC M and MSNBC and all of those CNN, Fox, all of them have uh, uh, are funded by Big Pharma. They're they're funded by Exxon Mobil. They're funded mm -hmm. by uh, and, th and this is in terms of advertising. But, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Studies media understands that advertising determines content. It's not the ownership. So when I used to do work around hip hop and 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 black media, uh, it didn't matter that Kathy Hughes was a black woman who owned all this black targeting radio because all of her advertisers were the same corporate. The way you pay for everything well. is people who were selling commercials against your right. content. So therefore, <laughs> the people who pay ultimately have the final say. 
Yeah, and then and then you, there, I mean, and there's so many studies and histories of this that detail this beyond my memory off the top of my head. But they, you know, they call it message force multiplying by putting military spokespeople as paid representatives of the state on CNN, telling us we should go to war. Uh, <laughs> you know, but you know, it's like, uh, you know, um, or or they'll have. Uh, um, you know, oil. They'll they'll say, okay, we just had this crisis with the spill in in Palestine, Ohio, or whatever. So let's let's turn to our expert from Exxon to talk about, you know, cleaning <laughs> things up. You know, it's like it's it, that's how they it, that's how they give themselves away. I mean, as yeah. Noam Chomsky used to point out, if you turn to what used to be the newspaper, that he would he used to joke with people and say, well, turn to the labor section, and it's a it's like a trick. There is no labor section. There's a business section. And that right. you might hear about labor there, but only right. from the perspective of business. Only from the perspective these of these greedy ass workers right. don't want to work. They're interrupting it, your goods and services. They're bastards. That's the only perspective you those get. Those unions, the, the unions are what's messing everything up for you because they make you they, they make everything go slower. We have to pay these people all this money and they get they have yeah. to take breaks. They they can't, you know, they have to have lunch, you know, it's, and they have to have health care. It's horrible. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's the perspective you get in media for sure and that's why One, we get you know that's why i start my book off on you know buying power with jay-z because he brings that just as you were talking listen, about he brings that black capitalist message i i, I want to i want to get you out of here on this but this is the, my eureka yeah. moment with jay-z because again as a kid <laughs> in high school you know, it's like we want to dress like Jay Z. We want to talk like him. We want to do everything right. Like I'm buying ice. I'm, well, not me. My parents are buying me iceberg. Later, they 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 got they became smarter black capitalists. It was like, why are we promoting this Italian shit when we can promote our own shit? Rock so away. I'm rocking Rockaware. I'm rocking S. Dot Carter Reeboks. I'm doing you know the whole fucking thing, right? And this is when I realized that we had sort of jumped the shark. It's when he started protesting Cristal. And he was like, that damn French CEO, the nerve, the way we've driven sales of their product, blah, 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 this, this, and that. Fuck Cristal. Mind you, most black people can't afford $200 bottle of champagne. But whatever, let's make it a black thing where black people as a whole are being disrespected for champagne that 99.99% .99 of them will never have, will never want to buy, whatever. Let's make it a black thing. I'm still on my, you know, black business, black, whatever shit. Then he's like, yo, man, I'm not even doing that. I'm drinking this new shit, yo, called Ace of Space. This shit better anyway. <laughs> and it comes out. That not only is this just some dummy company that just sprang up, Jay-Z, before he starts protesting Cristal on wax, purchases a company, shit champagne, so that he can now say, I already have the alternative. It was so fucking contrived, and the way that it was sold to us is this black liberation struggle. The, the, the manufacturers of this $200 per bottle champagne, shit, that, it was $200 back in like 2006. The manufacturers of that $200 champagne don't fuck with no black people. And so when we buy champagne, we're going to buy this one who happens to be what that happens to be owned by this one already obscenely rich black dude. That's when I sort of, I had crossed the, I was like, this is, I mean, it was one thing when it was so the only you know, thing, I'm overcharging labels for what they did to the Cold Crush to this. Cold this crush, is, right, right, right. But this is this, yeah, this is, is crazy. crazy. <laughs> this is terrible, right? You know, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, you know, what for me has made it easier to deal with is is that I've I've had a chance to to, to continue to try to learn some of the history and I and I'll and I'll uh, you know I, I got introduced to the work of this this black economist named Abram Harris, who in the early 1900s or the middle, by, by 1930s, was already writing about how this black capitalist messaging is some nonsense. And all the stuff that, that, you know, so all the don't buy where you can't work and buy black and the circulating dollar and all this other stuff, all these messages are 150 years old. They just get rebranded and updated. And he concludes his book by saying, or that, well, that particular book by saying something very harsh. I won't get the quote exactly right, but his point is that 
the black capitalists are the biggest enemy of the black community. Like they rip off the community more than anybody. He's like ex extra angry with them uh, for, for this charade that they carry out because all that ends up happening is that, as you said, they, that's the story. Everything is black power, black pride, black revolution until they get your money. Then it's me, 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 me. <laughs> I'm flossing. You're not. I'm drinking crystal. You thought it was beer. I'm rocking platinum. You thought it was silver. You know, it's 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 that whole thing. And look at me, niggas in Paris and all this other kind of stuff. And it's like that's why I love when 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 Yasin Bey or most deaf at the time came out with 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 niggas is poorest as a response track to that track. He's like, what are you all doing? Talk about in Paris. We out here getting shot up and dragged, don't yep. have jobs and healthcare. What are you doing? Yep. But but yep. they are also being carried. They're, the, the, the very political and economic enemies, class enemies, carry those messages, encourage those mm -hmm. messages. And then any of us, that's why I just, I, look, I, I my prediction is right. Having watched in mute and, and double time that last episode of Fight the Power in the background of our conversation, they've re they've erased all of the radical efforts and replaced it with the talking heads of Fat Joe and Killer Mike um, uh, as as the the, the the hip hop radicals fighting the power. It's 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 a total Travis Sham mockery is as, as others have pointed. You know, it's it's and it's and it's really you know. So people your age and younger, the, the students that end up certainly in my classes have a harder time and a, ch a bigger challenge. And I think at any point in human history, in in uh, um, you know maneuvering themselves through the madness to reach conclusions that, as Fred Hampton used to say, will actually conclude and answers that will actually answer, uh, because. There, never before, and that's why I was saying before, I'm, I've am i always taken the very unpopular argument. I would rather there be zero black representation in mainstream media and culture than what we get now, because it would be easier for the contradictions to be clear and for us to organize a radical response. Mm -hmm. The way it's going now, it's, it's, it's very, very the challenge is that much greater because everybody's being told, look, we got Obama whoa, elected. Whoa, whoa, hold good. on, hold on, man. The DEI, billion dollar DEI industry is here to save us, Dr. Paul. <laughs> Those of you listening on That's the pod and not oh, watching so the YouTube, slick. you got to see Dr. Paul's face. <laughs> that was so slick. That is so slick. That's another, yeah. that's what I'm saying. It's and I had, I, I won't, I won't say any names because uh, I got this off the record, but, but uh, uh, somebody I know within the academic community uh, changed his whole career. Uh, stopped, <laughs> stopped research, stopped academic work, stopped teaching because that's the new, in, that's within the, new the academic world, that's the, so he gets a huge check to put together diversity events Bruh, for his I've, I've, I've had i've taken some of the classes at my job and i'm just like guys i, I am the diversity <laughs> i don't need this Look, class. <laughs> larry fink who runs black rock created his what is it his environmental social governance score whatever he calls it his is his, his, it's the, the biggest the biggest lender has has said you all better create this mythology that you care about the environment and social justice if you want my money because that's the wave we're on right now. There's too many people. There's too many people, and I'm glad you actually kept woke in the title of your show because the right has tried to destroy the meaning of this. You know, and, so and this funny, is what Dr. Doing, Ball. You know, like, it's, so it's, anyway, it's yeah. come full circle with that name because when I originally started this show with my brother, um, Michael Brooks, he, um, we we did it as a as it was a supposed to be uh what you would call it ironic it's right. like yeah no yeah. like what whatever they're calling that shit in the mainstream which is you know identity politics blah 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 but intersectional you know basically i, I want we dude I, I bring this up all the time but the cia had a dei esque <laughs> commercial where they yeah, had, they had a, the latina yeah it, it was that I was just like, you know, and they and did it's the, like, the all LGBTQ attack helicopter dude, crew or whatever they dude, did, the first military all attack, dude, whatever, some some nonsense like that. You it's think like, they're you not gonna do you think they're not gonna back violent military coups in Nicaragua because they got some brown women in the damn it? This is crazy, but but, but you know, 
whatever. But now it's kind of come full circle where it's like, yeah, you got to reclaim the, the nonsense because like now woke is just a joke. And if somebody wants to call me that like unironically, then I invite that. You know what I'm saying? But um, anyway, if we, we I, I, you know, we'll, we'll have you back on the show at some Anytime. point. Anytime. And, and, and likewise, I think we, we, we need to we need to partner up and have you come through on our spot as well. So, when, so whenever you I, need, I, I man, I enjoy it. what you guys do uh, immensely. I always enjoy your analysis, man. Um, Jared Ball is a professor of communications and Africana studies at Morgan State. And please tell the people where they can find your work. And I mix what I like on all your social media. I mix what I like dot org has is is the easiest spot to to find whatever I'm doing. And 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 uh, look, I appreciate you having me on. It's always a pleasure to build, and uh, look forward to the next time. Thank you.